We're going to turn to our Bibles. Turn, if you will, to John's Gospel, chapter 6, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, hopefully we haven't hurt any feelings on those that are blondes. John 6, what a wonderful chapter we have here. Jesus making one of the most con- clear and concise stamp- statements about eternal life that you'll ever read. This is page 1123, if you are using one of the Bibles in the pew. I'll try to remember to give you the page number. John chapter 6, look if you will at verse 47. Jesus said, verily, verily, that means truthfully, truthfully. Jesus, of course, is God and God cannot lie. So he's not talking about, I'm not telling a lie, I'm telling the truth. He's saying here, this is a truth you don't want to miss, you don't want to ignore, you don't want to pass over this. I would recommend in studying your Bible that you would mark the verily verilies and pay close attention because these are truths that Christ is calling attention to by saying truthfully, truthfully, verily, verily. Listen to what I'm saying here. He says here, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He that believeth means to trust when you trust that Jesus died for you and paid your sin debt in full by his death and shed blood, was buried and rose again from the dead. When you believe on Christ, when you trust him as Savior, it says that you, in modern English, would read have, that you possess everlasting life. In other words, this is not something that you get after you die. I was under the impression most people I find think that they have to wait till after they die to find out whether they're going to heaven or not. And that's not true. Because we receive eternal life at the moment we believe and possess it forever thereafter. So you read through the Bible, the heroes of the Bible all knew where they were going to go while they were living, before they ever died. It wasn't like, I hope, but they said so many times, I know. Job knew. Way back there in the Old Testament, in the book of Job, Job said in chapter 19, verse 25, I know that my Redeemer liveth. He knew about prophecy. He says that at the latter day, his feet will actually stand here on the earth. Christ is coming to rule and reign on this earth. Maybe I ought to call up Hank Hennegraaff. Anyway, he's coming back to rule and reign on this earth. And that's literal. And then he says, though the worms destroy this body, talking about a recognition that he would die, yet in my flesh, referring to a new body that he would receive, that he would actually see the Lord with brand new eyes, a brand new body. Isn't that exciting? And this is what the resurrection is all about. When we get our brand new bodies, and Job knew that he was saved. Then we could go through the Old Testament and enter the new and find the same assurance as throughout the Bible. If you are genuinely saved, you ought to be able to say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I have a home in heaven. All of these things are true for the believer, and you ought to be able to say that. You can always detect somebody who doesn't know the truth, who hasn't received this wonderful gift and understood what the Bible says about salvation by having them respond when you ask these questions, I hope, or I think, or I would like to, or perhaps... I'm working hard at it. All those are expressions of somebody who doesn't understand what the Bible has to say. If you have truly trusted Christ, you ought to be able to say, I have eternal life. That's what Christ is saying here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth or trusteth on me has, modern English, everlasting life. That means right now. And that means if you have everlasting life right now, let me ask you the question, what kind of life will you have tomorrow? Boy, a little bit slow there. Let's try that one more time. If you have everlasting life right now, what kind of life will you have tomorrow? Excellent. Some of you are bashful. I can tell that you didn't really want to come out and get it wrong. If you have everlasting life right now, what kind of life will you have next week? If you have everlasting life right now, what kind of life will you have 10 years from now? If you have everlasting life right now, what kind of life will you have a million years from now? Very good. I told that to one fellow and he said, I don't think I'm going to live that long. Went right over his head. 
If you have everlasting life today, you'll have it tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now, it's forever. And so the believer therefore ought to conclude, yes, yes, I'll go to heaven. Yes, I have eternal life. Yes, I'm saved forever. Because Christ said if you believe on him, you presently possess everlasting life. Then we find earlier here in the chapter that he'll never cast you out. There's amazingly a number of people that believe you can lose your salvation once you've received it. And let's look at what Jesus said in verse 37. John 6, verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will cast out the first couple of dozen. No, it doesn't say that. I misread that on purpose. It says, Him that cometh to me, last in verse 37, I will in no wise or in no case, under no circumstance, would I ever cast them out. In other words, once you trust Christ, He will never cast you out. Isn't that good to know? So, in other words, Christ will never excommunicate anyone. There are churches that will cast you out and excommunicate you. But according to the Bible, Christ will not cast out anyone that has come to him. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So he will never cast you out for any reason. But there are some people who still insist on somehow losing their salvation. And so they'll say to me, Okay, I get it. I concede. Christ won't cast me out, but I can cast myself out. Why would they look for a way to get out <laughs> of eternal life? But apparently they do. But notice, that's not even possible because you can't even cast yourself out. Look at verse 39. This is the Father's will which has sent me that of all of which he hath given me, I should lose the first couple of dozen. No. I should lose nothing. That means none, not one, but should raise them up again at the last day. Notice Christ said he would not lose any. <clears throat> If one person in all of history were ever lost after they came to know Christ, Christ would be a liar. The Bible would be wrong. It says here it's God's will that not one person who ever comes to Christ would ever be lost once they get saved. So I tell people that you're stuck. Once you get saved, you have to go to heaven whether you like it or not. Now, that doesn't mean we have a license to live as we please. But we become responsible once we become born again, once we become saved, once we receive eternal life. And if we're delinquent, God will discipline the believer. You'll find him interfering in your life. And some of you have already experienced that. But he doesn't interfere in the lives of the unbelievers. But if you become born again, you become a child of God, God becomes your father. Then he says, if you're delinquent, I'm going to take care of you as a father would his son. And he chastens those that are his children. We also find that we're going to stand before a judgment called the great, rather the, the uh, judgment seat of Christ, where all believers will have their works examined to determine the degree of reward in heaven. So works will play an important part once we become saved in rewards or loss of rewards in heaven, depending on what we've done since we've been saved. But once you get saved, you are saved forever. He'll never cast you out. He'll never lose you. That is good news. I saw this the night that I got saved, and I knew that I had eternal life from that moment on. I was 18. I just got out of high school. I trusted Christ, and this was the most important news I ever heard in my life. I want you to look at the end of verse 39. He said, but should raise it up again at the last day. Last day. When is that last day? We're going to talk about that Keep that in mind. Look at verse 40 now. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, or acknowledgeth the Son, or who he is, and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up when? The last day. You find this phrase, last day, occurs numerous times. Now let's go over to chapter 11. And we have Lazarus, who dies. He's been dead four days and Jesus arrives on the scene in the eyes of Mary and Martha and the others. He was four days late. They were hoping he would have come before Lazarus died and had prevented his death. But now they are kind of blaming Christ. You can sense the anger in their words. They said, Lord, 
had you been here. You know, if you had been here, you would have prevented his death. But now he's dead, and it's been four days. Well, we find here that Jesus says in verse 23, Jesus said to Martha, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha saith unto Christ, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection. At what? The last day. There it is again, last day. And so Mary says, I'm, I know that. I know he's saved. I know he's a believer. I know Lazarus is going to heaven and I know he'll get a resurrection body one day at the last day. But that doesn't help me now because I was hoping you had been here four days sooner and you could have prevented his death. And then Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So if you believe on Christ and you die, you will live on in eternity. You'll be given a resurrection body at the last day. Then verse 26, he talks about a group that will be exempted from death, those that are living when Christ returns at the event of the rapture. And whosoever liveth, you're living, and you're a believer, and believeth in me, shall never die. If you want to mark in your margin, that's the rapture, my friend. There are people that will be living when Christ returns at the event of the rapture that will never die. Simply be transformed into their new bodies on the way up. I'm hoping to be one of those. I think we're close enough that perhaps this whole audience here, if you're a believer and you're living when Christ comes in the atmosphere and shouts in the clouds, that you'll go up to meet him and be transformed into your new body on the way up. Well, the Bible talks about this will all happen at the last day. Now, the last day is, of course, the return of Jesus Christ at his second coming. And the last day is the last day of the age of law that began at Mount Sinai that was interrupted by Christ's death and God turned to us Gentiles for the past 2,000 years and when this age is over, the rapture will happen and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and then the last seven years of the Old Testament will tick off the clock and the last day of the seven years of tribulation is the last day that Christ is referring to. And that's when all of the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints will receive their resurrection bodies. Now, we're a special group. We, in this age, it has been inserted and God has spread apart His plan for Israel. We are going to get our resurrection bodies seven years earlier than, than the last day at the event of the rapture. And so when this age is come to a conclusion, Christ will snatch us believers up out of here to meet Him in the air and it's at that point we receive our resurrection bodies. Now let's turn to 1 Thessalonians. And there are many verses I'd like to get to today, but I don't expect that I will. But we'll get to as many as we can to help make this clear. So if you turn now to 1 Corinthians, and I'll give you the page number. And this will be right before 2 Corinthians. We're now looking, I'm sorry, Thessalonians. Thank you for that correction. Boy, I tell you, thinking about that chicken. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 4, page 1269. It says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the event of the rapture. But here it is talking about those that since Pentecost who have died 
and are with the Lord getting their bodies at this event. What am I saying? If you die, and we covered this last week, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 So we don't lie in the ground. We don't lie in the casket. We don't lie in a tomb. You hear about the one man, he told his wife he was going to die. He says, I want you to take and sell everything I have, get all of my assets together, and I want you to put them in my casket with me because I want to take it with me. So at the funeral, she goes over to the casket just before they close the lid and puts a check there on his chest <laughs> as they buried him. If you don't get that, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> he could cash that check whenever he wanted to. All right. Verse 16. Here it talks about the dead in Christ rising first. Now look, if you will, at verse 14. This is the verse everybody misses. And it says, for if we what? Join the local church, pay 20%, be baptized three times. Uh, no. It says here, verse 14. If we believe, again, that's the key word, we trust, that, Je that what? That Jesus died and rose again. That's the gospel message. If you trust in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God, what? Bring with him. They're with him. Their bodies are spoken of as sleeping, but the soul doesn't sleep. The soul goes to be with the Lord instantly upon death, but the body is spoken of as resting in the grave until the resurrection. And what happens here at this event when Christ gives that shout, the bodies come up out of the grave and meet their souls in the air. And they're reunited, soul and body. And from that point on, they're forever with the Lord. Then verse 17 talks about, hopefully, us in this room. Keep breathing. Don't die yet. Hold on a little bit longer. And we'll be in this group together. Verse 17 says, Then we which are a what? Alive and remain. We're still here on the earth. We're alive and remain under the coming, notice here, uh, shall be caught up together with them, which group? The ones that have already died, we're going to meet those as they get their bodies just a split second before we get ours. And so they will rise first, according to the end of verse 16. Their bodies come up out of the earth, meet their souls in the air that Christ brings back with him. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them where? In the clouds, to meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the event of the rapture. And we are just a split second behind those that have already died. So somebody who died in the first century, second century, third century, fourth century, somebody who died last year, last month, or yesterday, they're going to be in this category of being with the Lord and coming back with Him. And when Christ shouts, their new body comes up from the earth and meets their soul and their reunited soul and body. Then we which are living are going to be caught up together with them and receive our new bodies on the way up and we'll be with them forever well it says here in the last part of the verse and we shall or so shall we ever be with the Lord and it says notice in verse 18 wherefore comfort one another with these words these are great words of comfort aren't they the fact that Christ is coming back and that we are going to receive our resurrection bodies when he comes and this is obviously one that gives us hope. That's why this event is called the Blessed Hope. And it gives us this expectation is what the word hope means. It's unfortunate that the English word is not a good one to be translated from the Greek word. The Greek word actually means something that you expect, something that you know is going to take place, something that you excitedly anticipate. But we use the word hope in a negative way, don't we? Hope it doesn't rain today. No. I hope my neighbor doesn't come by again today to bother me. Whatever it might be, but we use the word hope in that sense. But the biblical word hope, translated hope anyway, is a word that means something you, you anticipate, you expect. that It's an expectation. We expect that Christ is going to return. We don't know when, but we know he's coming. And we know it's getting sooner every day. And that we will meet him in the air. And this event, of course, 
will be when all of us in this age will be gathered together forever as a body, as a body of believers. Everybody from Pentecost till the rapture. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to read about the Old Testament believers and the tribulation saints. Revelation chapter 20. It's just about the very last pages of your Bible. We find in chapter 19, Christ returning at the last day of the tribulation period, at the last day of the Old Testament age of law, which still has seven years to tick off the clock. Chapter 19 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. And this one is the one that will come back to rule and reign on this earth. Verse 16 says, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is when things are going to dramatically change on the planet earth. The earth will be delivered from the curse. The deserts will blossom. Christ will rebuke all the nations and they will not learn war anymore. There will never be another war on the planet as Christ will bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. For those who say we were in the kingdom now, they're obviously dreaming because look at what we see in the headlines every day. The threat of war and real war occurring all around our globe today. But that will be over when Christ returns. We find that he defeats the Antichrist in uh, verse uh, 20. The beast is the Antichrist was taken and with him the false prophet. They're cast into the everlasting lake of fire, the eternal hell. Chapter 20. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. The bottomless pit is in the heart of the earth. It's the same as Hades. And Satan is going to be chained up down there in the bottomless pit. Think about it. If you were in the exact center of the earth and you wanted to dig your way out, any direction you would dig would be up. So it's the bottomless pit. You can't go any further down. You can only go up if you're in the middle of the earth. And that's where Hades is. And that's where Satan and his angels are going to be bound here, you will see. So it says you're having the key of the bottomless pit, put a great chain in his hand, or had a great chain in his hand, and he put, laid hold on the dragon. Who's the dragon? That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And bound him, how long? A thousand years. That's the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ. Cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Now, I take it that this is literal. That there is a thousand-year kingdom that will commence with the return of Christ on the last day of the Old Testament age of law, the last day of the tribulation period. And then for 1,000 years, Christ will rule and reign, and Satan will be bound up for that thousand years until at the end Satan is loosed for just a little bit. Then it says in verse 4, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of those which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And what happens with this group? They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That is all of the Old Testament saints and the seven-year tribulation saints. And notice they are resurrected at this point and given to resurrection bodies. And they notice they lived, they're resurrected, their souls are with the Lord, but they get their bodies. And they reigned with Christ, they ruled with Christ this thousand years. That is a literal thousand years. In the Old Testament, and in many New Testament passages, it's called the day of the Lord. It's a thousand year day. And we believe that once the raptures happen, 
Seven more years tick off the clock. Then Christ comes back at the last of that seven years, the last day. And that, of course, is the last day of the age of law that began at Mount Sinai. And that's the day when he will give resurrection bodies to the Old Testament saints and to the tribulation period saints. We get ours at the beginning of that seven years as the seven years is begun by us being raptured out and the church age being concluded. Now look, if you will, at verse 5. But the rest of the dead, the rest of the dead, lived not again until what? The thousand years were finished. Now that talks about the unsaved dead who will not be brought up out of the heart of the earth and judged until the thousand years are over. So in other words, there are two judgments that the Bible says will occur and two resurrections that occur. One occurs at the beginning of the thousand years for the saved and they lived and, and reigned with Christ for the thousand years. The other one is at the end of the thousand years when the unsaved dead are brought up, judged according to their works, assigned a degree of punishment in hell and cast into hell. Look at verse 14. Death and hell, it should read Hades. Do you have a Schofield or a reference Bible in the margin? Please notice under the little F, it'll read Hades. Hell and Hades are not the same place. There is no one in hell yet. Satan and his angels and the beast and the false prophet will be first in. And then the lost will be brought up out of Hades. They're in a place of flame and torment in the heart of the earth. And they'll be brought up and given their resurrection bodies with which they'll be cast into hell. It says death, by the way, that refers to the body, just like it did in 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead will what? Rise first. Their souls are with the Lord in coming back. The death refers to the body, and the body is spoken of as sleeping in the grave, and their bodies rise up. That happens first. Then we which are alive will be caught up to meet them in the clouds. Here, notice with the unsaved dead, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, that death referring to the body, and Hades, the place where their souls are in the heart of the earth, were cast into the lake of fire. So they're reunited also, souls and bodies. The lost will have bodies with which they'll be cast into hell. And it says this is the second death. And these are those who are cast into hell that were not believers. Notice verse 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So these are unbelievers. Their names are not in the book of life at this point. And if you become a believer, your name will stay in the book of life forever. And your name will never be blotted out. It will never come out. So we have here the two resurrections. One of the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints. And it happens when Christ comes back to establish his kingdom. The last day of the Old Testament age, the last day of the tribulation period are the same. And that's when Christ will establish his kingdom. Now let's go back to chapter 11. The book of Revelation is a series of overlays. And you might be surprised in, that we're in chapter 11 talking about the same event. But we are because the book of Revelation isn't consecutive, but it sweeps the seven years of tribulation, then comes back and sweeps it again, comes back and sweeps it again. And so here we have in chapter 11 the second coming event. The seventh angel sounded, verse 15 of chapter 11 of Revelation, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And uh, you ever heard that before? Handel's Messiah. He takes the words from Scripture and sets it to music. And it says here, The kingdoms of this world are become right now, Satan is ruling this world. If you don't like the headlines, make sure you know who to blame. This is where the devil is to blame. He's in charge of this world system. He has been ever since this earth was created. He was given that title. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says he's the God of this world. Can we believe that literally? Yes. When Christ was here the first time, 
he was taken up into a high mountain and shown by Satan all the kingdoms of this world. What did Satan offer him? He said, if you'll only fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Was that a bona fide offer? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was an illegitimate way of taking back the earth. And Christ, of course, told him that you're not to tempt the Lord your God. Again, a reference to the deity of Christ, that Christ is God. And Satan was attempting to tempt God himself in human flesh in the person of Christ. But we find that because Christ defeated Satan at the cross, when he comes the second time, he will take over the kingdoms of this world because he has the right to because of his victory over Satan at the cross. And he will take over these kingdoms and they will become his. The kingdoms of this world are become. This is at the second coming. This is at the end of the tribulation period. This is at the end of the Old Testament age of law. It says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall from that point on reign forever and ever and ever. Things will never be the same again. As finally peace will come on earth, goodwill toward men. Christ will be visibly ruling on the earth as king over the earth. This is exciting, isn't it? Wow. Guess what? We're on the winning side. You knew that, I hope. Okay? We're on the side that's going to win. We're on the, 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 the good guy's side. Uh, we're on the side of Christ who becomes the one who takes over this planet away from Satan. But right now, Satan's in charge. If you see the headlines, how tragic they are. Star football player from Jefferson High School gunned down in his front yard not too many blocks from here. We don't have to go to another city to hear about that. It's happening right here in Tampa. Police officer nearly killed in a drug bust in the hospital recovering right now. Just all kinds of violent acts being committed right here in our own city of Tampa. We don't have to go far to find uh, the headlines actually telling us that Satan's in charge of this world. I'm looking forward to the day when there'll be no violence. The Bible says they'll not hurt anymore, anywhere in the earth. That the nations will not learn war anymore. The whole earth will be at peace. What a wonderful day that'll be. But obviously we haven't arrived yet, have we? We're still living while Satan's in charge. Once we're raptured out, it'll get worse. The Bible says Satan then will really get a tight grip on this planet. And it will not be until the second coming when the kingdoms of this world are then become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. This is what the Lord's Prayer is all about. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy what? Kingdom come. What does it say following? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hadn't happened yet, has it? But God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven when Christ comes back and takes away the kingdoms of this world away from Satan and establishes his rule on the planet earth. We have a wonderful future ahead that we can look forward to. I'm on the winning side. You're on the winning side if you're a believer. And we're going to be taken out of this world before the worst occurs. And that is the seven years of the conclusion of the Old Testament age of law. Thank God I'm not going to be here for that. But if you're an unbeliever, you'll be left behind at the rapture. When the rapture snatches all the believers off this planet, if you're an unbeliever, you'll be left behind. Boy. One of the editors of the Schofield Bible, a man named Pettengill, I have a few of his books that are hard to get anymore, but what a wonderful man he was, a contributor to the notes in the Schofield Bible. And he loved to talk about the rapture. And he said that he would hope, he knew it wouldn't, it happens in the twinkling of an eye, but he said he had hoped that it would happen real slow. So that the believers, when we're caught up, would be kind of like in slow motion. He said, that's so that I could wave at everybody and say, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, I told you this was going to happen. And he just wanted to be able to say that to the world as he as he went up at the event of the rapture. Won't get that opportunity because we're going to be snatched out of here in a twinkling of an eye. But wouldn't that be fun? That would be fun. Wave at everybody say, Bye, I told you guys this was going to happen, and you didn't believe it. And they're left behind for the darkest hours 
of human history. Isn't it great to know that you're a believer? Isn't it great to know how the gospel is true? And sometimes people are offended by the message of the gospel. They are. I had a lady come in the office this week and she was boiling mad. Boiling mad. And I was the object of her anger. And she says, I hear you on the radio and and you just cut me to the heart when you talk about the Roman Catholic Church and other doctrines that are not right. And I said, I just try to speak the truth and I don't want to hurt anybody, but I don't want people to go to hell. And so whether it be Islam or Buddhism or Confucianism or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, I'm going to say they're wrong when they're wrong. Anyway, she was pretty feisty. She had her finger pointed at me and she says, Mr. Lindstrom, you need to stop what you're doing there. Oh, she said, excuse me, I didn't mean to point my finger at you. But anyway, I told her, look, if you can show me that I'm wrong, then I'll change what I'm saying. And I gave her our book that we have in the Resource Center, Understanding Roman Catholicism. I said, you know, I get a lot of my material from that book. I want you to study it. I'm going to give it to you as a gift. And if you will study it and research it and tell me this is not a fair presentation, that this book is really wrong, that this is really erroneous, I would like to know that. She took it. She said, I'm going to do that. And then it seemed like she melted at the end. She says, could I give you a hug before I go? <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to win people to Christ, not drive them away. And uh, we were able to have a good conversation where she calmed down and finally wanted to leave with a hug. And she's a cantor in the Mass in the Roman Catholic Church. She is a devoted Roman Catholic. And so nothing that I say does she like to hear. But you know, we can't keep our mouths shut. We have to speak what the Bible has to say. And I'm so tickled that we are able to reach sometimes people. And sometimes maybe they won't search it out. And they won't change from where they have been locked in to a false system unless we maybe stir them up a little bit somehow. Say, take a fresh look. See what the Bible has to say. And you need to trust Christ as your Savior. You know, we had a few, I guess about a month and a half ago, two months ago, we had a man at the door with tears saying, I came by to thank you for leading me to Christ on the radio. He said, I'm a sixth generation Jehovah's Witness. Not only that, he says, I was groomed and raised to be a leader in the Jehovah's Witness movement. That he lectured in at least 80 countries around the world for the Jehovah's Witness movement. The latest group that he spoke to was out in Seattle, Washington. 80,000 Jehovah's Witnesses assembled together. He says, I taught the witnesses what to say. I committed the unpardonable sin, he said. I said, what was that? He said, I listened to one of your radio programs. <laughs> he said he secretly listened for two years. And then he decided that he had been wrong. And he trusted Christ and his wife with him. Whew. He's a high, 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 high level witness. He shared that testimony with our elders and our deacons. We got to, had a meeting that day and I said, would you come in and share that with our leaders? 
He shared that whole story about how he came to know Christ. We don't know who we're reaching, but obviously he said, what you had to say sounded like truth. And he began to listen, and that was his unpardonable sin. It really turned out to be getting him out of the witness movement. We're living, I think, in a time when Christ's coming is near. You might have friends, you might have relatives that don't know Christ. Are you just going to sit back and try to just keep everything peaceful and calm? Or are you going to somehow try to present the message to them? Invite them out to a service. Get them a CD to listen to. Hand them a track. Confront them and say, look, I believe you're in trouble. If you die right now, I don't think you're going to go to heaven. I hope I'm wrong. Could you prove me wrong? Could you show me that you're safe and secure and on your way to heaven? And present to them what the Bible says and, and get some dialogue going on. What does the Bible say? And hopefully lead all your family members to Christ. As I close, you know, the gospel came to my family through my sister who got me out to a Bible study. The two of us then were saved when I got saved. And then we reached my brother, my sister, other sister. And uh, then we reached my mom and dad. And then we began to, as a family, work as a unit to go after everybody else. That was were fun days. Uh, my dad, I'd never forget it, was concerned about his dad. And on Sunday afternoon when we had nothing to do, he'd say, let's get in the car and check out Granddad. We'd get him on the back porch at his house and we'd grill him until we left satisfied that he knew the Lord. And we'd, another Sunday, maybe a month later, my dad said, let's go get check out Granddad again. Make sure he hadn't relapsed. Make sure he's got this thing right. And we'd grill him. And go over and, 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 and we were satisfied after many of these times. And I'll never forget my dad being w there with me and, and we teamed up, double teamed him. He didn't have a chance. We got him saved. And my granddad, when he died, I knew was in heaven without a doubt. Because we had had these conversations. We had talked about the issues and we had grilled him for the right answers. And he could recite them back. And my dad and I were absolutely confident that Granddad went to heaven when he died. That was great. And I remember I got the opportunity to speak at his funeral and I told all the relatives that came, if you ever want to see my granddad again, you're going to have to trust Christ because otherwise you won't see him. He's, he's in heaven. and You won't be there unless you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Your choice. You want to see him again? You have to trust Christ and pled with my family members and relatives to not miss this opportunity to receive the wonderful gift of eternal life and to be reunited with loved ones who've gone on before you. And I think somehow we have to decide that's important to do. That's something that must be done. And you're the only one who really knows better than anybody else where everybody stands in your family. And for somebody unsaved in your family... You have to take some initiative and somehow bring the message to them. It's the only way it can be done. I hope everybody here uh, would do that. Let's bow together in prayer and we're going to quit. With heads bowed and eyes closed, and those of you watching on the internet, wherever you might be in this world, I hope if you right now could not say that if you were to die, that you would go to heaven. If you couldn't say that, chances are maybe you haven't understood it as yet. Maybe you haven't trusted Christ as your only hope of heaven. I hope you will. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And so right now, just whisper a prayer between you and the living God. If you don't know what to say, you could say something like, God, I'm a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot about the Bible, but I believe Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he paid for my sins in full by his death and shed blood. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose again from the dead. I believe he's alive forevermore. And I trust Jesus Christ right now as my Savior to forgive my sins and give me the gift 
of everlasting life. I trust him as my only hope or only means of entering heaven. That Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior. And I trust him right now to save me. If you did that, God up in heaven knows he saves you. If you're looking for a feeling, don't look for a feeling. We're never told in the Bible to look for a feeling. Feelings are misleading. You have God's word on it. God can't lie. He's not going to trick you. If he said it and you believe it, that settles it. You have his word on it. You can look at it every day you want to, turning to the Bible and see what he says. So trust him right now. Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot, but I do believe Jesus died for me. I trust him right now as my only hope of heaven, believing his death and shed blood, paid my sin debt in full, that he was buried and rose again from the dead. I trust him to save me, to give me the gift of eternal life right at this moment. And God does. And if you did that, I'd love to be able to rejoice with you. What I'm going to do here is in being done in such a way that you'll not be embarrassed. We're not going to have anybody forward. We're not going to have anyone come running up and grab you by the shoulder. In fact, we're doing it so that no one will know. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed except for me. I'm going to be looking. And I'm going to close the service in prayer. And I'd like to include you in my closing prayer without identifying you. No one will know. But if you trusted Christ as Savior right here this morning, if you wouldn't mind, would you lift your hand and let me see? I'd like to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, all right. God bless you and you back there. Anybody else? You can put those hands down and see another one. God bless you. You can put that hand down. Anyone else? I trusted Jesus Christ right here this morning as my Savior. And I'd like you to know, I'd like you to pray for me as you conclude. Anyone else say, include me too. I just now, today, trusted Christ as my Savior. Slip it up and put it down. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you Oh, for these six or seven, who knows, that just indicated they trusted you as their Savior. If they had died yesterday, wow, they wouldn't have made it. But today, and from this day forward, they can rest assured that whenever they die, they'll go to heaven to be with you. This is a wonderful day for each of these six or seven that just now said they trusted you as Savior. Give them assurance. Let them know it's really true. That salvation is not in this church. It's not in me. It's not in an organization, a denomination, or rituals. But it's in Jesus himself. And when a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ, they can be absolutely certain of going to heaven. Bless them. And Lord, and just excite us all about how we can have an impact. We pray, Lord, we would not look back one day and regret that we let some family members slip into eternity without Christ. For whatever reason, maybe we were afraid or thought we might offend them more, whatever it might be, that we wouldn't let those things stop us, but we would, in love and sincerity, say, look, I want you to be in heaven with me. Here's how you can be sure. Lord, give us courage. Give us a great day. Bless the dinner that we're going to enjoy in just a moment and our week, and we ask you give us all great courage to live for you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.